I hope no one bought a ticket or clicked on a YouTube link thinking I would be talking literally about hostile extraterrestrials. The idea of prepping for the alien invasion is a fun way into thinking about all those challenges that we see on the horizon, challenges that are complex, challenges that present us with a great deal of uncertainty, even though we know that they're coming. Challenges like climate change, rapid technological change, food security, public health. And I'll be speaking even more specifically about the importance of education in the humanities, arts and social sciences in preparing for these kinds of challenges. Now, some of you are probably thinking, this doesn't sound very TED. This doesn't sound like an innovative new idea. This sounds more like an angry old professor of sociology howling into the wind about changes that he just doesn't want to accept. Some of you are probably sympathetic to the idea of education in the humanities, arts and social sciences, and you might be wondering, well, where's this going? What's new? There's a constant drip feed of debate. Well, is it debate? Discussion that passes for debate in the media about the ongoing value or otherwise of the humanities and arts. Well, there certainly is a discourse out there, a narrative out there, about the way in which rapid technological change ought to be reflected in our educational priorities. Technological disruption, artificial intelligence, big data, data fusion, synthetic biology, all of these new technologies will, will develop a digital economy in which safe, secure, reliable work depends on skills in the so-called STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine. I was going to make a joke about the two Ms, kind of making it more STEM, but I thought that's probably going to be a bit lame. No one will laugh. See? <laughs> uh, now, I have an Uncle Don. Maybe you have an Uncle Don, or if you don't have an Uncle Don, you probably have an Uncle Dave, or someone who's a bit like my Uncle Don. Now, when I was a teenager, and bear in mind, for young people, I was a teenager back in the olden days, the 1980s, and Uncle Don was a bit of a regular at our place. And usually after dinner, almost always after di dinner, Uncle Don would fix me in his gaze, he'd lean forward, he'd pause, he liked a dramatic pause, Uncle Don, and he'd say, computers. There was always another dramatic pause, say computers. Computers are going to be everywhere. You should do something with computers. And he was right. Computers are everywhere. Not that I ever became a computer scientist, but we all work with computers. He was right on both counts. Computers are everywhere, and I do something with computers. And people who say the same thing today about artificial intelligence, they're right too. People who say the same thing about big data, they're already right. We already live in the age of big data. We just haven't always figured out how best to manage that. Now, the way in which this sort of narrative about technological change is reflected in education systems varies from one educational jurisdiction to another, but there's a very consistent message that goes out to young people. You ought to be a part of this. And that sends a message to young people that if they want to be part of the future, not just secure themselves a reliable and satisfactory career, but if they want to be part of the future, if they want to play a role in shaping the kind of society they live in, they need to take the STEM path. So there's a counter-narrative that comes from people, generally people like me, people who've made careers in the humanities, arts and social sciences, and our counter-narrative says, well, yes, the digital economy is here. But even in the digital economy, we need the sorts of skills that you might learn if you're studying, whether it's at high school or primary school, high school, university, vocational training, lifelong learning, 
You need the sorts of skills that you'll develop through humanities, arts and social sciences. You need to learn effective communication. You need to unleash your creativity. You need to develop your critical thinking skills. And there's a grain of truth in this too. If you talk to employers, some of the things they, they value most in employees are exactly those attributes. Business surveys routinely identify people who can work in teams, solve problems in interesting new ways, and string more than one sentence together coherently as being exactly the sort of people they want to hire. Thinking beyond the labour market, I think it's fair to say that those sorts of skills are critical too to a functioning democracy. In the age of fake news and the hyperpolarisation of absolutely everything, I'm not sure if nevermore we've needed our critical thinking skills, but we certainly need them, certainly need them critically today. There's a few too many criticallys there, but it's, it's critical. Now, <laughs> critical thinking is not scepticism. Critical thinking is not cynicism. Critical thinking is the opposite of cynicism. Critical thinking is knowing how to weigh evidence, consider alternatives. Examine your own assumptions. Test your assumptions. Maintain an open mind. Accept that you could be wrong. Be very clear about where you're uncertain and how you manage that uncertainty. Critical thinking is the exact opposite of cynicism. It's the exact opposite of conspiracy thinking. Critical thinking is the exact opposite of disagreeing with people because you think they might vote differently to you. They might have worn the wrong colour T-shirt or they might have the wrong slogan. Critical thinking is about maintaining that openness. <coughs> Creative expression is just as important to a functioning democracy. Where do we get our sense of community? If we don't want to generate sense of community through us and them, through polarising, through, through, through black and white, Australian, un-Australian, cyclists, non-cyclists, where do we get our, our, our sense of collective identity? We get it through those shared expressions of who we are. And when we experience those, we start to see things from other people's perspectives. We start to experience something of another way of life, another culture. We start to develop that connection, that emotional as well as that cognitive connection that says, you know, we are a community, not only despite our differences, but in many ways because of our differences. Now, the problem with this argument as a, as a basis for maintaining our educational investment in the humanities, arts and social sciences is that you don't actually need to study the humanities, arts and social sciences in order to develop your communication, creativity or critical thinking. Any well-designed curricula in any discipline will help students develop these kinds of attributes. My first degree was in agricultural science, not in, not in a social science. And I've worked with, 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 with agricultural and environmental and other kinds of sciences my whole career. I can't imagine science without creativity and critical thinking. In my mind, those two things are exactly what science is. Any kind of science, social, natural or otherwise. New ideas, Robust testing. Always looking for alternative explanations, better ways of seeing the world, always going to the data, trying to find ways to prove yourself wrong. And how counter is that to the hyperpolarisation of social life? A whole enterprise that's based on people checking and rechecking that they could be wrong that someone else might actually be right. I've never studied medicine or engineering, but I can't imagine people engaging in large engineering projects or running complex medical practices without teamwork and problem solving. So if it's important for people like me to maintain our educational and for that matter our research presence in the humanities, arts and social sciences, we need a better argument than generic skills.
everything we teach young people should be developing those generic skills. We need to address the more substantive issues. Now, I began by speaking about, uh, amongst other challenges, rapid technological change. If you look through any technological revolution in history, you'll see that it was a social revolution, a political revolution, an institutional revolution, an economic revolution, and a cultural revolution. Every period of profound change requires the insight and the skills of people with backgrounds in humanities, arts, and social sciences. Let me talk briefly about one example that's dear to me. What does rapid technological change mean for Australian agriculture, international agriculture? What does it mean for issues like food security in light of a changing climate? Technological options that are now with us today give us all sorts of opportunities to address those challenges in interesting new ways. Synthetic biology promises us far more productive plants and animals. Advanced sensing, the internet of things, big data, data analytics, these promise much more efficient processes of land and natural resource management. Telecommunications and distributed ledger technology promises access to new markets, creating new relationships between producers and buyers. We've got opportunities for new products, for new production systems, for new marketing and business systems. We can come at this in all sorts of interesting new ways, but none of this is inevitable. And positive social and economic outcomes are far from inevitable. So how do we generate those? Well, I'd argue we need to develop three kinds of infrastructure. And every one of those infrastructures requires the expertise of people in the social sciences. We need physical infrastructure. Now, that's going to surprise you. What's the role of the social sciences in putting together networks of satellites and sensors and wires and optical cable and all sorts of other things that create the connection that we need to use most of this technology? Well, putting those things together into viable systems requires planning and business analysis and economics. The second kind of infrastructure we need is regulatory infrastructure. Now, obviously, there's a role there for law. There's also a role there for regulatory theorists and public administrators. Without the right regulatory apparatus, we don't provide innovators, large or small, with the certainty they have to invest their time and money. And we don't provide technology users with the certainty that their interests will be protected when they purchase and use this technology. The third kind of infrastructure we need is institutional infrastructure. Not one big institution. I'm not talking about the Department for the Digital Economy. I'm talking about all the connections we have between innovators, researchers, educators, investors, students, and so on, that together start to pull together really interesting and exciting regional innovation ecosystems. Every technological revolution has been a social, an economic, a cultural, an institutional revolution. If we want to get the benefits of technical, te rapid technolo technological change, whether it's in agriculture or any other domain of human inquiry, of human effort, it has to be about the people. It has to be about the community. Because when we pull these things together, when we utilise the full range of skills that we have at our disposal, and I think I think you would have picked up that I'm very positively disposed towards disciplines like science. This is not a zero-sum argument. We have enough polarisation. We don't need polarisation between, between the disciplines. We need education and we need innovation systems that pull these things together. Every revolution is a social revolution. The future is not about disruption. The future is about community. The future is about us.